All right, before the review starts, let me just say that you have to take uh, the rest of this review uh, with a bit of a grain of salt. Because, first of all, this is obviously just my personal opinion. And also, a lot of this review, you will notice, is me sorting my grievances with the game. And that is mainly the purpose of this review. Because let me just say that uh, I absolutely love this game. And it really sticks true to the Mass Effect. For me, of course, this is again my opinion. It really sticks true to the Mass Effect series for me. And it makes me feel so, um, just so immersed in the world and the universe. And I really do like... Uh, the characters. A lot of this will be captured in the last bits of the review, so if you want to hear me um, give this game some love, skip to the last bits of the review and you'll hear some of that. But most of this review is me gonna be criticizing a lot of the game's weak points, because really what the uh, things that I really love about this game can be really summarized in a few words, which is of course, this game stays true to the Mass Effect the Mass Effect series. This game makes me feel like a Pathfinder. This game has amazing characters, which a lot of people will say is what the Mass Effect series is all about. This game really makes, um, really makes you feel immersed in the universe. This game has great settlements, great worlds, great mechanics, great gameplay. And a lot of it can really be summarized with those broad terms, and the rest of this review is really going to be nitpicking um, at the flaws of this game because the compliments I have for this game are really too broad to go into nitpicking. So enjoy the rest of the review and if you want to hear me give this game some more love, skip to the end of the review. Uh, most of the review going on from here is me going to be uh, picking out some of the flaws of this game. Alright, let's get it started. Hello, and today I'm going to be reviewing Mass Effect Andromeda, and this is a bit of a controversial game uh, when it comes to reviews, as this is the, uh, you, as you should know, this is the newest installment in the Mass Effect series after the original trilogy, um, which ended in 2012 at the release of Mass Effect 3. And just recently, uh, Mass Effect Andromeda came out, which was being uh, hyped up for a little while now, and some people were very disappointed in this installment of the franchise and doesn't think it did the original trilogy justice. So I'm going to be reviewing Mass Effect Andromeda from a position where I can try to give at least as few spoilers as possible for the main story. So I'm not going to be touching on the main story as much, um, because at least for me, that wasn't the biggest part of the game. So, uh, let's start with the premise for Mass Effect Andromeda. It's, it's, um, it's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, so, in the, after the events of Mass Effect 2, uh, I believe it's uh, very close to after the events of Mass Effect 2, where Commander Shepard destroys the Collector base, and, and, or, of course, uh, saves it. That is when uh, the events of Mass Effect Andromeda start. So, it's before the Reapers actually invade. Uh, so it's after the events of Mass Effect 2, but before the events of Mass Effect 3. Because if they did it while the Reapers were invading, that'd be a little bit hard, and you you think you would have seen something during Mass Effect 3, which you don't, of course. And if it's after the events of Mass Effect 3, as you know, while there's the whole joke that... Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> well, while there's the whole joke that the endings are just, oh, with just different colors, um, the endings did have different, very different meanings. So, even though technically, oh look, green green explosion, red explosion, blue explosion, uh, that's the ending of the trilogy. No, but they actually did have lasting impacts on the universe, even if it didn't really show the ending effects. So, uh, that would be very hard to do that. What if, you know, Commander Shepard uh, ended up 
you know, uh, ended up not stopping the Reapers. In the extended cut DLC, there's a fourth ending where you can just refuse and let the Reapers kill everybody. So they avoided that entire, and all that crap, and they simply went with the option to leave before uh, the events of Mass Effect 3 started. And that, I think, is the best decision. A lot of people wanted that to be true, and that was true. Uh, I believe that was called the early exit theory, and that turned out to be true. So, what happened was, is that, let's talk a little bit about the, some of the science. So, I'm sure a lot of you will understand how uh, faster than light travel works in the Mass Effect universe. If you're not, here's a bit of a crash course. Element, they uh, humanity finds an element called element zero, which allows them to uh, manipulate the mass of objects and basically create artificial gravity, uh, um, turn ships and make them have negative mass, which can theoretically allow faster than light travel. They also find these mass relays and join the galactic community in harmony and everything's great. So, but when you're, when a starship and uh, this is quoted uh, from the Mass Effect uh, universe, when a starship uh, is in FTL for too long, they have to discharge their drive core at the magnetic field of a planet or on a planet itself. So again, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's uh, around what it is. And that's a problem because when you're jumping through dark space, uh, uh, it's a very long way and you're not gonna you're probably not gonna find any planets to discharge your drive core and it builds up a static electrical charge um that could eventually you know blow up your ship if you're um not careful now i'm not saying oh this is science and this is true i don't want no don't worry you don't have to be a scientist and start commenting about oh that's not true this is true this is quoted from the mass effect um codex i believe so um what they did was they came up with this thing called the Odyssey Drive Core. Basically, it uses, uh, and by the way, I really like how they explain it. They don't just, they could have very easily done something uh, to just like, they could have very easily completely ignored it, uh, but they did not. Now, I think they could have gone a better route. Uh, I'm not saying I have a really good one, but I feel like that's almost a little bit lazy. So what the Odyssey Drive Core does is that it takes static electrical charge and transforms it into a usable power source to power the ship. So, while that sounds pretty cool and that, you know, oh, well, that eliminates the problem with the drive core, I just feel that since it's such a simple explanation, I, it's surpri I'm surprised that nobody's come up with that in the Milky Way yet, uh, especially since the fact that it happened, that since the fact that the Asari discovered faster than light travel uh, so long before the humans even arrived at the scene. It's kind of stupid, and it's a bit of a cop-out move, and I'm gonna have to take away a point from Mass Effect Andromeda for doing that. But still, kudos to them for actually trying to come up with an explanation, even if even if it's some crap. Anyways, moving on. So, basically, uh, there are four arcs and a Nexus flagship, which will act as kind of a citadel hub when you get to Andromeda. The arcs are Human Arc Hyperion, Solarian Arc Pachero, Turian Arc Natanis, and Asari Arc Lucia, uh, I believe. That's what the Asari Arc is called. Anyways, so basically, the plan is for them to arrive in Andromeda. Uh, the, arcs, the arcs go to what they call, they scanned on long-range scanners. Um, to see what they found these golden worlds in something called in the place called the Helios Cluster of Andromeda. Now you have to note that they can't leave the Helios Cluster because the only reason they were able to leave the cluster um, in the uh, original trilogy of the in the Milky Way was because of mass relays. So there are no mass relays in Andromeda. So for the entire game, you're basically stuck in the Helios Cluster. And the problem is, is that the Mass Effect Andromeda world is much bigger than the world of Mass Effect 3, while still being in a single cluster. Now, I know what you're saying, oh, but that's just because you didn't have time to explore Mass Effect 3. If you had time, then you'd do this and this and this. Uh, I get that, I get that. But I'm saying, they should do... I feel they could have done a better job at making Helios feel smaller. They really should have made Helios feel smaller. Because the problem is, Helios feels pretty big compared to the Milky Way, or it, maybe it does feel a little small, but it's so packed full of systems. And another thing is, systems don't really have crap to do in them. Um, and in the Milky, and in Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3, uh, especially noticeable in 2, I feel, um, you just had like a bunch of scattered 
uh, star systems, star clusters with two or three systems with crap to do in it. You don't have crap to do. Uh, at least you could scan planets and land on them in Mass Effect 2 and 3 and do N7 missions on them. In a Mass Effect 1, you could do planetary explora exploration. In Mass Effect Andromeda, they say planetary exploration is returning, but as far as uh, I'm concerned, the only planets you can freaking do on it are are the only planets you can actually explore, really are, um, really, really explore and just stay there and go back there like hubs, are freaking Eladin, Kadara, Eos, um, Bold, Haval, and uh, probably some other one uh, I freaking forgot. Uh, but it's, it's insane because now, I get what they are trying to do. They were saying, okay, because Mass Effect 1, there were a lot of planets you could explore, but they really, they were really barren, and it was extremely boring and tedious to go around on them. But at least it felt big. The world felt big. In Mass Effect Andromeda, um, the world, the world, I'm talking about planets. The planets, they feel humongous. The planets are humongous in Mass Effect Andromeda. Um, and it, in the... They do such a good job of balancing it, I feel. Where you would say, oh, well then it would take forever to get across it with the new Mako called the Nomad. Uh, it would take forever to get across it. But it really feels good. The, I gotta say, planetary exploration, I know they wanted to bring it back and they wanted to try to um, fix it. Well, mission freaking accomplished, can I say. They did, a, they did an amazing job at balancing that crap. Planetary exploration, for me, again, this is a biased review because, well, not biased, but this is a, a review of my personal opinion. Planetary exploration has never freaking been better. But, and also, in a way, Helios does feel smaller. It does feel more compact because everything is done through animations. And I feel that's a way it can feel more compact. Everything is done through animations. Uh, and that can be a little irritating sometimes. In the Tempest, I mean, your ship, it went Andromeda, it takes the place of the Normandy, basically. So, um, the Tempest, basically, uh, it uses, it, it's very fast and it's stealthy. The reason it's stealthy is it uses the same technology of the Normandy in the original trilogy, the IES stealth systems. And that kind of made me scratch my head. Because wasn't the Normandy supposed to be a super secret Alliance Turian blueprint? Um, how did it get out so easily? Cerberus was able to do it, but they actually had a pretty valid explanation. Now you could give the same explanation Cerberus gave, Cerberus gave, which was something like, um, I don't know, something about investors or some crap. But really, I feel like they're throwing around the stealth systems uh, for no freaking reason. Uh, I know in the in the story you do need them because there is an enemy there, the Ket, which we'll talk about later. We're talking about aliens, but when you're going to Andromeda, you shouldn't expect trouble. Why would I think the best, the most important thing for like a pathfinding ship would be speed, because I think the most important thing would be speed. And if you're really gonna try to have like a, um, let's be honest, the only one of the only main reasons you would want a stealth system is to hide from someone. So why the frick wouldn't you give the arcs and the Nexus you're traveling on some sort of defense? Because this is a bit of a spoiler, but it's not that big because it's happening in the first few seconds of the game. When you get to Andromeda, you're freaking the arcs are all freaking attacked and the Nexus is attacked by this thing called the Scourge. And the Scourge is this dark energy cloud nobody freaking knows about. It's like, who knows what this is? And that's okay. That is okay. Because we really shouldn't be explaining crap. This is a series, This is it's beginning here. The Mass Effect Andromeda, I'm gonna call it the series because if Mass Effect doesn't make another Mass Effect Andromeda like Mass Effect Andromeda 2, it's not Mass Effect because one of the key things in Mass Effect is your decision carries out from game to game to game. So if there isn't a Mass Effect Andromeda 2, it wasn't really a Mass Effect game. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't fulfill the purpose of a Mass Effect game for me, um, but I, I like the idea how it's not really explained, uh, and nothing is really explained completely. It's good, because we shouldn't know crap. Nobody should know anything. That's good. Now, they took this goal with, you know, talking about Helios Cluster as a whole. Um, they took this, I guess they took this meaning with Helios, where what happens is, the Nexus is supposed to arrive, the mothership, the type of the Citadel area, 
is supposed to arrive before the other arcs. And what happens is, is that it's supposed to build itself completely, then the arcs arrive and dock with the nexus of boo ha ha the whole world works, right? Uh, of course, they have to go with the freaking video game cliche, but it doesn't, it's not that simple. It doesn't work out. I swear, I really wish they would have gone a whole nother way with this. Because, I, I mean, I would have loved it so much, it would have been so much better if, if, if maybe everything kind of went to plan. Because even if you are an Andromeda and things go according to plan, you're still going to have things you don't know about. Like, if you still wanted those remnant mis mysteries, which is basically a lazy freaking rehashing of the Protheans, uh, I'm sorry, it is. You can say, oh, but the remnant, um, actually, well, they leave a uh, technology behind that you have to fight, so uh, it's actually much better. No, stop, shut up, they're the Protheans. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, they're different in ways, but it almost feels a bit lazy, like, okay, the way we're going to explain inhabiting planets is through using remnant secrets. Again, they could have gone with a better direction. Uh, this game screams to me, some of the aspects of this game screams missed opportunities. That could have been much better than it is now. Uh, that being said, it's an amazing game, and I'm going to get to the pros a little bit later. So, basically what happens is, uh, your arc, the human arc, arc Hyperion, again, I'm just explaining the first part of the story, I'm not going to get it any further than, like, the first, the first act. Uh, so, in the first act, basically, uh, Hyperion, the human arc, um, blah, 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 it makes your way back to the Nexus, makes your way to the Nexus after they find that, oh, they went to the human golden world, which is, which it's supposed to be, but, oh no, something went horribly wrong! Uh, <laughs> something went horribly wrong but so they arrived at the nexus and and oh no something went horribly wrong uh, again so what happened was is that the nexus isn't fully built they find out that they're running out of power because the other arcs haven't arrived and blah 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 hyperion hooks up with the nexus and uh gives the nexus its power so that's good uh uh that's it's kind of fun uh, I know I was kind of ragging on the fact that they like, oh, something will be wrong, but that's not as much of a problem as I have. It's just a little pet peeve of mine, where I wish they didn't do that. So, then, blah, 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 you talk with all the Nexus leaders, you figure out that there was a mutiny, oh no, and uh, when the Arcs were no, weren't there, and before the Arcs arrived, or just Arc Hyperion, because the other Arcs are, aren't there, aren't there yet, you find out that uh, there was a mutiny, oh no, and a bunch of people got exiled, and now there's a whole new enemy group, exiles. So you've got Nexus exiles there, uh, around the, um, around Andromeda, I'm sorry, uh, sorry, around Helios, and, uh, they don't like you, they will call you, they will call you, how, what are you doing, Nexus? Oh, one of you, one of Nexus's lapdogs will talk to you like that, and I guess that doesn't, it bothers me a little bit, because here's the thing, it's another thing of just adding things to the world before you got there. You feel like, a, I want to feel like a pathfinder, I want to feel like I'm the first person on some of those places. Uh, I know how, like, oh yeah, but it wouldn't be good mechanically, gameplay wise. Listen, I'm just saying what I would have liked. What I would have liked is I want to step on a planet and wow, here I am, let's begin pathfinding, as in, let's begin finding a way to get people on this planet and make it a viable place to live. But no, every single planet you um, drop outposts on, spoiler alert, they're all freaking inhabited. Whether it's by Exiles, Ket, uh, the new race, by the way, I'll talk about later, the Angara, uh, the Ket, or Exiles, and spoiler alert, all of them are there. Um, so Helios, they went with the way with Helios, that, uh, and here's what I'm talking about Helios. They make it already feel inhabited. They make it feel, I think the way they were going for it is, it's a wild frontier with different factions and everyone's arriving and every, nobody knows what to do. It's, it's this wild frontier and you gotta tame it. And it's, it's good. I'll be the first to say, it's freaking amazing. I love it. I love taming the wild frontier of Helios because Helios really is a wild frontier and they make it feel that way. But what they really don't accomplish is a sense of exploration because every area has already been explored. And that really, 
And that really kind of gets me, gets me a little bit mad because every area is already freaking explored. You're just there for the initiative. And uh, honestly, I don't, I don't mind it that much, but I feel it could have been better. It could have been way better. Let's talk a little bit about the aliens, the Ket and the Angara. So the Angara, so the Angara are a new alien race that uh, you make first contact with. And that's pretty cool. I wish it would have been done better where, you know, they explain, uh, I know uh, a very famous scene in Mass Effect 2 is where uh, um, Fem Shep, if you're romancing Thane, you will hear a little thing like, oh, my translator just glitched. And that's the only mention of translators in the original trilogy. They do mention translators in Andromeda, and it's when talking about the Angar, since they're a new species. I wish it would have been more of a of a problem to talk to the Angara. I wish it would have been more of a challenge to communicate with the Angara. But no, you arrive, you get the Angua, you get the Angara all on your side. You're like, oh, hello. They're like, hey, you better be careful. And they talk to you, talk to their leader, blah, blah, blah. You get an Angaran squad mate the second you arrive on their planet and you freaking are in alliance with them. A few main quests later, you're in alliance with them or you're not or whatever. But basically, it's just like they could have done it better. They could have done it way better. They could have made it harder to communicate with them. They could have made it, wait, how do we talk to these guys? What do we do? What are we going to do? How do we talk to them? We need to try to get our translators working. You could have had a few side quests where you where you try to program the translators. What if you had to like talk to them by like, just pointing, just holding things? What if they misunderstood you? What if you did something wrong? It would set you back in your endeavors to start an alliance with them. It could have been done better. It could have been done so much better. But bottom line is, I get why they did it. I get it. It's a gameplay thing. They got to have the gameplay. You got to have the Angar and squad make. And... You gotta have the Angar, you gotta understand them somehow. I get it, okay? And the Angar and squad mate, I like him. I like him. He's a good squad mate, okay? So, uh, moving on, the and looks of the Angar. The looks of the Angara really also could have been done better. They don't look that alien. And I know what you're saying, uh, but the species in the Milky Way, they didn't look that alien either. Uh, true, they didn't. Um, but take an example of the Hanar. I know they look exactly like jellyfish because there's a whole joke about them. Oh, you big, stupid jellyfish. I, I get it. They're jellyfish, okay? They look like jellyfish. But didn't they look very alien, those big, giant jellyfish? And the Elcor and even the Drell, even though they had two legs, two hands, a uh, mouth and eyes, they still looked alien. The Asari still kind of felt alien because of their culture the turians they didn't feel as alien but who doesn't love a freaking turian who doesn't love garris vacarian kicking butt all right i feel like they could have done it better for example the cat the cat looked scary the cat looked pretty scary uh they got like bones jetting up they use their own like they have their, their own their own they have like an exoskeleton that they use for armor and that's really cool Actually, uh, I would have liked it if they switched the Angara with the Ket. Let me tell you why. Because imagine the hostile race in the Helios Cluster are these like pink thing, alien things, or you would think like, because the Angara, they, they look nice. Let's be honest. They look nice. They have very humanoid features. They look relatable. And you're like, oh, that's so nice. Um, but imagine the Ket, these exoskeleton just, just i'm talking about the appearance all right uh everything else could have been safe you wouldn't need to change the story at all just change the appearance so imagine changing the appearance of the two species wouldn't have, it would have been harder to get uh, an angara that looked like that to initiative speak the initiative species to like them it would have been harder to make diplomatic relations which is just scary people Maybe make them, um, maybe make them very nice, and again, keep everything the same. Make the appearance different. Make it look weird. Make it look scary. Don't make it look freaking basic as heck. Come on, come on. Anyways, so honestly, it could have been done. Uh, again, a lot of this game screams missed opportunities. Um, but now I want to talk about a very key part of the game. 
facial animations. Now, I'm not going to spend this mu that much time on this topic. I'm probably going to only spend like a minute or so or 30 seconds because I cannot, and I cannot stress this enough, I cannot say anything about the facial animations that hasn't already been said before. And let me just say some things, and I know they've been said before. First of all, it rips you out of the experience. It really freaking does. And it's not just the facial animations. And no, and yes, this is after the 1.5 patch. The animations still suck, okay? Yes, the 1.5 patch helps. Thank you for telling me that. Thank you for educating me on the 1.5 patch helps. It freaking sucks still. It really does. And the way a face looks sometimes when male rider's face like catches some light, it looks like his, some of his face has actually been burned off because he has like ripples on his face almost. And it's really weird. It, it And yeah, it's just, it takes you out of the game. It really does when those facial animations start. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, but when you compare, most of them are bad, but when you compare them to the original trilogy, heck, the first Mass Effect, the facial animations, Shepard's face never in 2000, when did, when did the freaking first Mass Effect come out? You know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look that up right now, right? All right, I'm gonna look that up right now while I'm recording, all right? All right, when did Mass Effect come out? When did Mass Effect come out, all right? Let's just see, let's just see, all right? It came out in 2007. Mass Effect Andromeda, you came out in 20 freaking 17 and you're getting freaking steamrolled by a game that came out in 2007 when it comes to your animations. Are your animes made us freaking stupid? Like, do you not know how to use the Frostbite engine? Are you that stupid? Honestly, Mass Effect 3 still looks amazing and it came out in 2012. Just use the Unreal Engine if that's what you're good at. You don't have to use a new engine. Uh, you don't have to use a new engine if you're stupid. I'm so, I know it sounds mean, but you don't. If you're dumb and you don't know how to use the new engine, don't use it, <laughs> okay? They don't know how to use the, the, fro the gameplay. Let's talk about the gameplay for a second. The gameplay is freaking superb. It was done by the same studio, I believe, that did Mass Effect 3's multiplayer. And the problem is, um, it, 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 it really kind of takes you it doesn't really feel like Mass Effect that much. Because Mass Effect, if you remember, it's getting on the squad wheel, just like tactically looking at every single thing, and then just selecting power. Okay, Liara, use Singularity on that enemy. Garrus, use Overlord on that enemy. And I'm gonna Biotic Charge this enemy in the center, and we're gonna wreck them. No, you can do none of that. You have three abilities, and you have to use them in real time, which is Mass Effect 3 multiplayer. And you can't use any, and you can't command your squad members other than go here, go there, attack this target. And that really takes away from the experience. It really does. Now, the thing that you only you can only use three powers at a time that doesn't bother you as, mu as much because you can change. Um, you can have like, you can have I believe um, four favorites. Each of them could have three powers, so you still have quite a few powers that you can have. Um, but. It's, it's still, it still really kind of takes, it still really kind of, still doesn't feel as much as the original trilogy. But honestly, I'm okay with how it is because it's endless fun. The gameplay is endless fun. Mass Effect 3, Mass Effect 2, and Mass Effect 1, the combat could get a little tedious. And yes, it was good, it was fun, but it could get tedious. I've never felt myself saying the gameplay has gotten tedious in Mass Effect Andromeda. It's always felt good. It's always felt great. I, I love it. I love the gameplay. It's just that you can't command your squad members. And that is a bad thing that I won't uh, wipe away. But there is a, a good side. There's a plus side, a bit of a plus side. It's that if you remember in the original trilogy, um, at least for me, when I play it on like high difficulties, I play Mass Effect on hardcore difficulty for through the entire trilogy of Mass Effect Andromeda. That's the difficulty I play on hardcore. And the squad mates are freaking stupid. <laughs> I'm sorry, they are. I've never had a squad mate that has known what to freaking do. And being able to control their powers actually made them useful. In Mass Effect Andromeda, they are actually smart. They actually know what they're doing. They actually know what the frick they're doing. And that's 
great. I'm so glad they actually know what they're doing in this. That's amazing. But I still would have liked to control their powers. Also, one of your squad mates, Cora, has Biotic Charge, which is awesome. You get to see somebody other than yourself using Biotic Charge in the trilogy. Imagine how cool it would have been to have, in Mass Effect 2, Jack using Biotic Charge. That would have been great. Ah, uh, it would have been superb, perfect, if Jack would have been using Biotic Charge in Mass Effect 2. But anyways, so, um, starting to, I guess I'm, I'm going to start wrapping this all up. Uh, and kind of a little bit starting the conclusion, I guess. <sighs> so, Mass Effect Andromeda, it really has its ups and downs. But in the end, what's important? Does it deliver in gameplay? No matter how much I've criticized it before, I have to say, it does deliver in gameplay. It delivers in gameplay, all right? Now, how does it deliver story-wise? Um, the story-wise takes a backseat for me, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to explain that much of it because I don't want spoilers. Maybe I'll do a spoiler talk later, but so, how does the story? Now, when I think story Massacre Andromeda, I don't think of the main story. I think of the side quests, because really the side quests take the front seat. So for the main story, it's okay. It's okay. Alright, it's pretty good. Pretty good. It's okay. Nothing to write home about, but it's pretty good. It's okay. Now, what about the side missions and the side quests? Amazing, freaking 10 out of 10 for the side missions and side quests. Not all of them, obviously, but I love them so much. Um, some of the, the loyalty missions, like Peavy's loyalty mission, stand out for being, uh, for, like, when you're, you actually you jump out of an escape pod and you're falling down, and there's this one scene where, like, the, the little, Things come down from the escape pod, the thing, you know, the uh, roller coaster where they come down and they take your shoulders and your chest and they strap them down. And there's just one scene with the Krogan, you have Drac. It doesn't come down, it just keeps hitting the top of his head because it doesn't go down. Um, the side missions, I can't say enough how much I really like them. They can get repetitive, but I've never felt myself saying, now I'm bored because I have to do this, because I have to do this. Because if it does become just planet crawling, the planets are still interesting. <laughs> They're still really cool. This is still fun to drive around, and it's still, it's still great. The conversation system. Let's talk about that for a second. The conversation system. You don't have the Paragon and Renegade options, which honestly, I don't have that much of a problem with. Let me tell you why. Because Commander Shepard, I felt he was a sep. The point of Mass Effect for me was that Commander Shepard was a separate person. I was not Commander Shepard. Commander Shepard was Commander Shepard. And Commander Shepard had a distinct personality trait. You could definitely shape it. But Commander Shepard's distinct personality trait was either Paragon or Renegade. Yes, you had hundreds of dialogue options to choose from, but it was either Paragon or Renegade was his, really, was his real baseline personality, right? And for uh, Ryder, I know female rider and male rider actually have different um, dialogue options because they're two different people. I played male rider. Male rider, um, to me, really shows a very, he's not as much as a paragon or as much as a renegade. He's more of a lighthearted, he's, he's a lot younger than Commander Shepard, first of all, okay? He's a lot younger than him. Actually, I don't know by a lot, but he is younger than him. Uh, Ryder's in his tw 20s, Commander Shepard's in his 30s. Um, I don't know how old Ryder is exactly. Uh, I can look that up real quick. But I know he's in his 20s and Commander Shepard's in his 30s. Um, let me just look up. So, Mass Effect. Andromeda. Age. Of. Ryder. So, what is the age of the protagonist? So, the age. So, um, the age doesn't change for because they are the twins. They exist um, at the same time in the real world, and they kind of give you a little bit of a crap excuse why you can't have your other twin interacting in the world, really. It's kind of stupid, um, but I, I get it why it has to be that way gameplay-wise. I get why you have to take the front stage and your twin has to take the backstage. Still kind of makes me go, eh, I wish it, they would have done it a little bit better, but you can't have any, you can't have everything. So, the twins are approximately 22 years of age. 
Commander Shepard, if I'm correct, is around 31, 32, 33 years of age. So quite a big of an age, quite a bit of an age difference. And it shows, at least for male rider. I can't speak that much for female rider. I know female rider has more of a professional outlook. While you can be sarcastic, female rider does have more of a professional outlook. Male rider does have a bit more of a sarcastic, kind of jokingly personality. And honestly, it really helps me not see the riders as just templates, more as actual people. I really feel uh, Scott Ryder is a person. I feel Sarah Ryder is a person. I feel Commander Shepard's a person. And I think they did a good job at that. Uh, however, the, the um, some of the dialogue options are are awkward but for the majority of the part i felt the dialogue options in my opinion to be satisfactory and i don't think they should have put the paragon and renegade options back in because that wouldn't have made it rider that would have made it a commander shepherd clone wouldn't have been rider it would have been shepherd okay now talking um now i want to talk about how because paragon and renegade obviously trans uh, obviously transferred into the dialogue system where you could convince people and if you didn't convince them right you wouldn't get certain rewards or you wouldn't complete a certain quest line or you wouldn't or you wouldn't like or you wouldn't uh get the good option bad things would happen basically if you didn't have the right paragon or renegade score i wish they would have put that back in they could have done it in a different way like they could have made a reputation or something where how reputable is the Pathfinder? And you could have like, how reputable you are among the common initiative person, the initiative hierarchy. You could have how rep, how, what your reputation is um, in the Exiles, what your reputation is in the Angara. Hell, even what your reputation is in the Ket. Endless possibilities, but no, no. If, if you choose the right dialogue options, you freaking convince someone every time. Uh, there's no actually having to be a persuasive person or a reputable person. No, no, none of that crap. They just completely scrapped the persuasion and intimidation system. Now, for me, the persuasion and intimidation system were two, whereas was almost a separate entity than the Paragon and Renegade. Even though Paragon gave points into the persuasion, Renegade gave points into the intimidation, I, they could have done something else with reputation um, and made Ryder more reputable. If Ryder was reputable, he could have gotten this dialogue option. You know, but no, no, you don't have that. Just if Ryder pushes hard enough, he can do whatever the frick he wants. Anyways, so wrapping this up, I know I said I was wrapping this up about 10 minutes ago, but wrapping this up, overall, the game makes me feel like a Pathfinder. The dialogue is engaging. The side quests are fun. Planetary exploration is fun. I feel immersed in the world. It, I care about the characters. The characters are, I really like. PB um, is, I know it was, she was, it was Joe, like she was not Liara. Hey, look, it's not Liara. PB is just not Liara. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't really feel that way. PB feels like her own person. Now, I know the beginning premise of PB feels like it's Liara because she's working on an ancient, ancient civilization. She's young, blah, 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 and that's the same, basically the same basic premise of Liara. She's young, she's interested in ancient technology from an extinct race, and she's, um, she's young, yeah. But everything else, honestly, everything else, also they use biotics and tech abilities. In the first Mass Effect, Liara used both biotics and tech abilities, PB uses biotic and tech abilities. That's where the similarities end, because PB is so much, so different than Liara in so many ways. She's so much more outgoing, she's joking, she doesn't really give a crap about some things. She's really outgoing and just kind of happy-go-lucky as well as just, she's not reserved at all. PB's different than Liara. Take her name, for example, PB. There's this one, there's this one scene, because in The Nomad, the new Mako, which handles much better than the Mako, by the way. It's really great. Um, in The Nomad, you really, really, it really feels, um, it really handles uh, quite well. But there are conversations that your squadmates will have when in The Nomad. And one of the things, when your Turian squadmate, Vetra and PB are together, PB, Vetra will ask PB, what does PB stand for? And PB says, oh, it's peanut butter. My name's peanut butter. And it's, and, but her, her actual name, by the way, is, Pelisaria Basale. Uh, would you hear Liara calling herself Lili or something? Or 
Lee T, Liar to Sony, I don't know. Uh, but you see what I mean? PB, Liar to Sony, completely different. I know there was a joke, no, Liara, no, completely different. Drac, he really, 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 really feels like he's old. Rex, Rex said, oh, I'm a thousand years old, but he didn't look it, he didn't feel it. Drac feels old. He talks like he's old. He He's constantly mentioning how, oh, my process, he has like, he's like, he's talking about how oh, one of his hearts went out, how he's, he, he's just so old. And he really is, he's an old grizzled warrior. warrior. And it really feels like, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't feel forced. It's not like, oh, I'm so old, I'm better than all of you. Drac really does feel old, and he feels pretty good. I like how Drac feels, and honestly, <laughs> there hasn't been an unsuccessful freaking Krogan that everybody hasn't loved. Everybody loves the freaking Krogan, all right? Everybody loves the Krogan. Uh, there's also a little side thing where the Krogan actually aren't really part of the initiative because they left because of something that happened during the mutiny, which I won't get into. And, but the way, the reason the Krogan are there kind of feels forced. Honestly, it does because it really feels as if the Krogan are forced because it's like, why would the initiative species take the Krogan? Because I know there's actually a Corian arc, which you can hear about, but really the main arcs that went were the human arc, were the main the species that went to Andromeda first, all right? The species that went were the humans, the Asari, the Turian, the Salarians, and the Krogan. What do the first four species all have in common? They have seats on the council. They are trustworthy. They trust each other. Um, while they may have a history of conflict with each other, they are, they are completely uh, alliance. There's no hostilities at all between them. Yet you take the Krogan. It's so stupid. It really is. Because really, every single species was taken. Every single count species was taken. No other species were taken. The only other species you decided to take in the quote-unquote first wave of going to Andromeda was the most violent species in the Milky Way. And two of the races that are going to Andromeda 2 had deployed the freaking genophage, the sterility plague upon them. Yeah, yeah, great job at explaining why the Krogan are there, Bioware. You did, you did a bang up job there. God, it's so stupid. And only 1,200 Krogan went to Andromeda. And I get that. I get that it's a small number. But come on! 1,200 freaking Krogan could probably destroy the entire initiative. Krogan are destructive. They're huge warriors. It's so stupid. And it can't, I can't believe this was just, just brushed aside where uh, one clan went brushed aside. Shut up! I can't believe you're doing this. In the original trilogy, it was such a big point where nobody freaking liked the Krogan because they were afraid of them. And now they're fine with them coming to Andromeda and they're, they're surprised and they broke off from the rest of the initiative and they lied to them. By the way, the Krogan broke off because of something that happened during the mutiny where the initiative lied to them. Why would you lie to the Krogan? I mean, come on, people. It's so, so overlooked and it's not freaking, ugh. And you'd think that the Salarians or the Turians would completely boycott the Andromeda Initiative by saying, we're not going if the Krogan are going. What the hell? And it's so overlooked. And I feel like it's just an excuse to get a fan favorite in there. And that's because it is just an excuse. Don't get me wrong. Every single Krogan I met in the game, amazing. Love it. Glad the Krogan are there. But they could have explained it better. And they're lazy for doing it. All right. <sighs> but I digress. A uh, Korra, another one of your squad mates. Really, she honestly, she's, she's pretty, she's pretty nice. She actually trained with the Asari, and that's kind of a little side thing there. And you have to work with her to um, find. I won't say what it is, but you do have to work with her to do some stuff that involves the Asari. A very important mission, by the way. You need to complete a loyalty mission because it's very important. Um, I won't explain what it is because it is there are spoilers in it, but. Uh, yeah, she's a biotic commando. She has biotic charge. She's really cool. Uh, overall, she is kind of jealous because she was next in line to be Pathfinder. Your dad picked you. And honestly, there's a little bit of tension in the beginning of the game. And because it, it makes sense. I mean, she trained, she's ready to go, yet your dad just picked you out of the blue. It makes sense. 
Liam, Liam is the human male squad mate, and what can I say about Liam? He, he's a very emotional person. He's a, he's a crisis response specialist, is what he is, uh, in the game. And he was a police officer. He, overall, he's a very emotional fighter. He's very emotionally attached to the things he does. And he wasn't just a bland character. Like, the bland male human character. I think there's like a very stereotype where there's just bland human male characters in Mass Effect, where not human characters, but human squad mates. Let's take an example, Caden. Caden, honestly, I don't really have a problem with Caden. I thought he was pretty okay. Uh, I didn't mind him that much. I kind of liked Caden. But a lot of people complained that he was bland. And honestly, for good reason. We got a Mass Effect 2. Jacob. Nobody liked Jacob. He was really bland. He just, he didn't have any character development. He was just cut and dry. Um, then Zaid. Zaid was a DLC character. So honestly, he really, he, he was, he was pretty good, but he was a DLC character, so he was going to count. Um, Mass Effect 3, James Vega. Uh, again, a really bland, not much, not much, just like, he's a space marine. He, that's all he really is. Um, I, and personally, I like probably everybody I named on this list to a certain extent, but they all had very big character flaws, and that was being boring and basic. With the, um, excluding Zaid, of course, because, uh, I love Zaid. Now, Liam, they fixed it. Liam is actually a per person with development. He is, he is reckless. He honestly is reckless. You can choose to encourage his reckless behavior and be like, okay, we gotta get this done. We're in Andromeda. We came here to take risks. Or you can say, we need to be cautious. Be careful, Liam. What the hell are you doing? And he's very emotional. So he's not just gonna be like where if you say, oh, we should be more careful. Liam's like, okay, we're, we'll be more careful. And you just change his character like that. Not like the original trilogy. No, if you say, if you say, uh, oh, we need to be more careful. What were you thinking? To a certain extent on his loyalty mission, he'll actually, he'll actually say, F you, what are you talking about? We came to take and drop, we came to drama, take risks. He'll, he'll, he'll curse you out and he'll walk away. And that's how his loyalty mission ends. If you, if you disagree with him too much. And honestly, it makes sense. You still do gain his loyalty, but it, it, it feels good to have a character that actually is a person, right? Liam is a person. He's an emotional person. He's not just gonna change because you freaking told him to. He's an emotional person and he's steadfast on what he says. All right, moving on to Vetra. Vetra, the Turian, probably the one squad I'm most disappointed with. That being said, I love all the squad mates, but if I had to choose one that I would rather not have, it'd be Vetra. Uh, because Vetra, she really, she's, she's, she's kind of a Torian outcast. And this isn't the problem, this is not my problem with her. My problem with her, I'll tell you later. But she, her, Vetra's character, she's the Torian outcast. She never joined, as you know, as you may or may not know, Torians have a very military society. Torians are military first. You have to serve the military while you're on Palavin. Vetra dodged that because her father moved her off world before any of that could happen. And... And it's kind of nice having a Torian that isn't just all military and crap. And honestly, she, she's pretty she's pretty cool until the fact that she realized that they really humanized her, which I didn't like. A very f a famous line, at least in my head, it's probably not famous to anybody else, is when you have Liam and Vetra in the Nomad, and Liam will say, did you lose anybody in the first contact war? I won't go into any depth on the first contact war. You should know it if you're a Mass Effect fan. If you don't know about the first contact war, then I don't think you played the original trilogy. That's fine, so I'll just give you a quick explanation. Turians and humans had a brief war when humans arrived with the galactic scene, blah, blah, blah. Very small, very small casualty rate, basically. Uh, Liam said, did you lose any people in the first contact war, Vetra? Vetra said, don't you mean the th Relay 314 incident, which is what the Turians call it? And Liam says, well, I guess that means yes. Then uh, a little while later, Liam will ask Vetra, did you lose anybody in the first contact war again? And Vetra will say, what is that even supposed to mean? How is that even supposed to further this conversation? And Liam was just saying, oh, well, I'm just making small talk. Small talk is nice weather having, not did your pops, did your granddaddy shoot, shoot my pa? And she said it in a Southern accent too, which I'm not saying that offends me because I'm Southern. No, that doesn't offend me because I'm Southern, okay? Shut up, and I'm not Southern. <laughs> Going on a little tangent there. Um, no, that doesn't offend me. It's, it, it makes me say, wait a minute, why the frick would a Vetra a Turian be talking in a southern accent? And it makes me scratch my head. And honestly, 
that's basically the premise for the humanize it, the human making Vecha seem more human when she shouldn't be. She's a Turian. She's not a freaking human. She's a Turian. Why don't you be talking in a southern accent? Well, uh, you see, Vetra could have learned that uh, through being with humans. I don't care. She shouldn't have said that. That was, it way took me out of the world, and it made me think less of Vetra. And a lot of things involve Vetra being more human, and I don't like it. She should be a Turian. A Turian outcast, yes, but she should be a Turian. Anyways, so, uh, again, I like Vetra. I like Vetra. I talked about why I like her character, because she's different than other Turians. But still, if I had to pick one character not to have, maybe her. <laughs> so, what did we talk? We talked about in the squad mates. We talked about PB. We talked about Draft. We talked about Liam. We talked about Vetra. We talked about um, Cora. We talked about PB. Now let's talk about Jaw. I think I repeated myself for one of them. <laughs> let's talk about Jaw really quick. The Angaran squad mate. Honestly. He's pretty good, don't have any complaints. Other than the basic complaints I made about being guard about making them more alien. Other than that, honestly, wasn't that bad. Don't have that many complaints about Liam. Pretty cool overall, honestly. I mean, I meant Jaw. Pretty cool about Jaw overall, honestly. Um, he's not that bad. Jaw's pretty cool. The guard are very open with their emotions. Jaws, I really like Jaw as a character. He's learning, He's he could have been put more alien, but other than that, Jaws pretty good. Jaws pretty nice. He serves almost a Mass Effect 1-ish role, where in Mass Effect 1, the squad mates kind of introduced you, were kind of ambassadors for their own species. Jaws kind of acts like that, but he actually takes note of it. He will actually say to Liam if he prize if Liam prize too much, he'll be like, oh, tell me about this Jaws, tell me about this Jaw. Jaws will be like, oh, I'm not an ambassador. Stop asking me questions, Liam. So, Jaw, he is an ambassador for the species. He does serve this uh, purpose of being an ambassador for the species. But he really is uh, his own person. And so Jaw, overall, I think you should, the, a really good attractive quality about Jaw is that you really should discover him for yourself, discover about his character for yourself, because the point is Jaw's alien, Jaw's an alien. Even more alien than any of the other aliens because you've never met those species before. So therefore, you should really learn to have Jaw for yourself. I like Jaw. Moving on. In, in uh, I guess I'll try to finish up the conclusion again. I know I failed. This will be the third time me failing at drawing a conclusion. Uh, if I fail again, because I've just been going on tangents, tangents. Um, Mass Effect Andromeda. It makes me feel like a Pathfinder. I really feel good about planetary exploration, even though even with the criticisms. Um, it really makes me feel, it makes me feel, like, it does make me feel in some points like it was thrust into the position. The Tempest, fun. This game is uh, endless fun, alright? This game is endless fun. I have criticisms, but those criticisms, um, all boil down to one thing. The game is endless fun, it really is. If you, if you want to have, if you are a fan of the original trilogy, I honestly believe you're going to have fun with this game. People criticize it, in my opinion, actually too much. I've criticized it a little too much in this video, but that's only because how much um, how much I've played the game and I've noticed about it because I just love the game that much. This is an amazing game. It really sticks true to the it really sticks it really sticks with me as a great Mass Effect game, and I really like it. I cannot stress this enough. If you're on, if you if you if you were thinking about buying Mass Effect Andromeda, buy it. Buy Mass Effect Andromeda. I'm telling you right now, buy it, all right? Mass Effect Andromeda is a great game. You're going to get your money's worth because you're going to have so much content. You're going to have wonderful characters, wonderful out making outposts and settlements and all that stuff. You're going to have a great ship, The Tempest. While the animations, you can't skip them sometimes. It can be irritating. It's a beautiful world. It's great. Mass Effect Andromeda, you really, you do feel like a pathfinder, you do feel like you're trying a course for the initiative, you're building alliances, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're rescuing people, you go to the Nexus, you go back to the Nexus, and see, and you can see the changes, some of the changes that you make, it's great, Mass Effect Andromeda, overall, is a great, amazing, satisfying experience, especially to me, as a Mass Effect fan, who's played through Mass Effect three times, Mass Effect Trilogy three times. I've played through the Mass Effect Trilogy, once again, three times, and, and I'm saying this is a good game. If you're on the fence of buying it, buy it. If, you, if you're on the fence, 
Bye. If you if you are just watching this review for fun, and uh, if you're just watching this review for fun, and just because you want to know about Mass Effect Andromeda, awesome. Hope you had a great time. But if you do want to buy it, once again, buy it. If you want to buy, if you're on the fence of buying this game, you really should um, buy it because this is a great overall game. It really is. Some of the things that Mass Effect Andromeda does absolutely great is some is it's it's graphics. It the vistas you see when you're um, on some of the planets. One of the things, my favorite things, is on Eos, the first planet you go to. It's great. You go over this hill, you see these monuments of you don't know what they are. These cat things coming out in the cat. The cat. Let's talk about the cat just for a second. The way the mis the mysteries about the cat are great. You're, you're uncovering the mysteries to the main storyline. What's going on with these cat? You find out that they're actually there's there's more cat. You don't. I'm not gonna spoil it, but you the cat are such a satisfying enemy. And it's not like the Reapers, where they're just the enemy takes the forefront of everything. It's so satisfying. It really is how the cat are. I really appreciate the cat. I appreciate discovering remnant technology. Uh, I. I love how the Nomad is, I love visiting new planets, it's great, it's fun, the Nomad is endless fun, you can research and develop products, and honestly, <laughs> researching and developing things in Mass Effect Andromeda, so good. <laughs> I researched and developed a gun. I, I developed a gun, it was, it's a huge, it's a, it's a huge gun, and it shoots very rapid grenades, it's like, and all the grenades explode and it's glorious and they use my research points my resources and when you get and when you andromeda viability increase the viability of andromeda increases you you get uh you get these points and you can deploy um uh, cryo blocks you can deploy different cryopods that will give you rewards because the people that come out of those cryopods will do things for you and you get in-game rewards and then the apex missions the Apex missions tie single player directly into multiplayer, and this really makes multiplayer an, an optional feature, and it, it's just so good. It really is. Mass Effect Andromeda, while some of the aspects scream miss opportunities, the majority of the game, for me, just is amazing. Just awesome. I love this game. I really, really do. All right, this is going to be the conclusion. Thank you for watching. I hope you had a good time watching this review, even if you're not gonna buy Mass Effect Andromeda, even if you were never thinking about Mass Effect, buying Mass Effect Andromeda. I hope I succeeded in entertaining you, entertaining you. And Mass Effect Andromeda, and I'm not here, obviously I'm not, and honestly, I don't care if you buy the game or not. This is a, a review basically telling you how the game is and helping you um, helping you to see if you want to uh, purchase it or not. Um, and I hope this helped you with finalizing your decision. Whether you, this made you conclude that you don't want to get Mass Effect Andromeda, or this made you conclude that you do want to get Mass Effect Andromeda, or you just wanted to get entertained. I hope you enjoyed, or if you already do have Mass Effect Andromeda and you just want to see somebody talk about it. I hope you enjoyed this video, no matter what the case. Thank you for watching. I'll probably be posting on this on um, this channel some Mass Effect Andromeda gameplay. Um, this review is um, this is the final part of this review, and thank you for watching.